drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC, DLC Drop, drop Podcast. Podcast. All right. Thank you so much for joining me on the DLC Drop Podcast today. Cam Kelly, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well, John. Thank you. Right on. I'm hyped to have you in studio. I always say the best episodes are in studio. So we met a few months ago and, um, you know, in your new role here as VP of Marketing and Brand at Maestro. Mm-hmm. And just excited to share your insights. Um, I know a lot of people in the industry and I regard you as one of those people who just really have an extremely strong marketing and business knowledge to pair with your understanding of the industry. And that's really rare. So excited to have you share it with our audience. That might be the nicest thing I've ever heard anybody say about me. And especially coming from you, that means a lot. I appreciate (laughs) that. Appreciate that. Absolutely. So to give the audience a little background, you and I met, you're at Complexity Gaming. Mm -hmm. I was at GameStop. We did the big GameStop Performance Center deal at yeah. that incredible uh, location. Um, you gave my son a tour one time. I did. I remember him with all these. It was just one of the most amazing things about that facility is just the access to see how how pros train. Yeah. And I think there's a lot there that just made it obvious to people like, okay, these are people with very special skills in the same way that the top NBA players in the world just, you see Steph hitting that shot? Yep. You can't hit that shot unless yeah. you're born that way. <laughs> the way that these guys in Counter-Strike are hitting those shots, you can't hit those shots unless you're born that way. I think it's one of the best kept secrets in esports. And by the way, it's probably my favorite tour I've ever given at, at Complexity. And there was a lot of them, you know, when we would have the schools come in, I think that's the thing that really surprised us. Not the kids, but the the teachers, the faculty. We had mm-hmm. had several administrators come in and, and tour as they were building out their esports operations. Um, and that access is really required to progress the industry forward, um, understanding that these guys aren't just, you know, sitting there fidgeting and playing and playing and playing. Like the the film review that goes into it, the level of detail that goes into it is something that I feel is underappreciated in our industry. Yeah. Um, and so when you see kids kind of faced with that reality, it becomes less, I want to be a pro gamer content creator and I need to work on my skills. <laughs> so right. those are those are really uh, pivotal moments for me. Um in, in understanding what needs to happen in the industry um, from a from a perspective of what the players endure. Yeah, and I think they did a great job, too. They brought in um, Baylor, Scott & White. Mm-hmm. They brought in Mamba Sports at Canopy. And so they brought in these, you know, traditional industry, traditional sports-type companies mm-hmm. that aligned with what was happening in esports. And I think for a lot of people just made that connection, like you're saying, uh, with the teachers, with people who are on the outside, how is this a thing? Why are people watching people do it? Um, how is there a career here? And are there any real skills, not only skills to do that, but that are transferable to, to many other things? And the answer is yes. And, you know, that facility made those things obvious. Um, and that's a lot of what I'd love to de- dig in with you mm. is, you know, what are these best practices uh, that are missing? You know, what are some people who are doing it well? And, you know, let's, I, I like to be critical of the industry in a way that's respectful, like not as a troll, but as a way to be a realist and say, I love and appreciate this industry that I'm a part of, but let's help it become more sustainable because right now it's extremely volatile, in my opinion. Yeah. And I don't disagree with that at all. I think the, the one thing we have to remember is that it's, it's your training. Um, and it's much easier when you look at physical sports expertise because you see it all very externally. It, there's right. a lot of measurement. There's a lot of factors that go in. There's a lot of metrics that go into it. Um, and the problem a lot of the times is in esports is measurement, isn't, measurement hasn't caught up to the scale of the industry. We're talking about milliseconds, and that's a little bit cliche at this point, but the way to measure it is actually understanding the mapping of the brain and how synapses fire in the brain. Mm. And we were you know, towards the tail end, and I'm sure they're continuing moving forward, still very big fans of what they're doing at Complexity. Um, but we were starting to really get serious on understanding muscle movements. And, you know, a lot of folks don't know this, but in the iris, there's about 5,000 muscle fibers that actually indicate 
uh, brain performance. So there are only 5,000. They, <laughs> they, on average, there's, there's about 5,000. Um, and what that tells us is the level of serotonin, dopamine, uh, stress hormones like norepinephrine and others that are indicating what the player is actually experiencing in the brain. Mm. And we can actually start to train those behaviors. We can start to improve that. And I think what we're looking for are our groups like, you know, Mamba Sports Academy. I think the work being done at, at UTD's Center for Brain Health, for example, are yeah. really awesome examples. And how do we create those new metrics? There was no QBR 15, 20 years ago. There is now. And it tells us a whole lot more about um, measurement, the experience, what actually matters. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'd love to see a day where we're really looking at things from a money ball perspective as we look at team construct and program development. So I think that was one of the things that was coming out of it and then testing testing products and things like that in that same vein Yeah. Um, because equipment then comes right after that and in, in what right. we're doing. There's a lot of folks doing some really cool work, and a few of them have been on your podcast. A few, yeah, <laughs> trying to get more. So, I mean, when you talk about measurement, I think mm. there's a variety of types of measurement that are missing in the esports space. You I know, agree. you're talking about like these physical things, reaction time, muscle fibers, etc. But from my marketing lens, <laughs> I'm seeing there's a lot of measurement that's not happening at all. That's true. From a data perspective, it's true. And as I've talked to you, many different people across the industry, I keep coming back to the data. And my role at GameStop, what I experienced, uh, number one was I was trying to get a lot of influencer stuff going. And I was basically like, look, we need to get Dr. Disrespect to be playing COD early when it comes out and him saying, I got it early from GameStop, you should get it when it comes out That's from right. GameStop, yep. right? And the answer that I was getting at the time was basically, we've tried influencers before, we can't get any data out of them. And, you know, if I can't get any data from my campaign, even if I did something right, I don't know why I did it right. <laughs> if I do something wrong, I don't know how to pivot. And then when you go further to media rights and these more sustainable forms of revenue for the yeah. industry as a whole, I was talking to somebody the other day who's really brilliant on that side. And I was like, help me understand media rights. Because I know in traditional sports, it's a thing. Right, like that's where the majority of their revenue comes from. Yep. It's very sustainable because they have these ten-year contracts. Mm. Yes, they have a short lockout <laughs> every now and then. Yep. But the partnership revenue in traditional sports is typically kind of the cherry on top. You'd hope it was. Well, it's, in it's traditional, the whole cake. <laughs> right, but in this industry, yeah, it's all of it. And what I experienced at GameStop once again, this is why I got involved with the Esports Trade Association to help improve these business practices. And I said, wait a minute, the majority of the revenue is coming from partnerships right. and partners are not receiving an ROI on their investment. Terrifying. It's it's a frightening reality and we joke about it and we smile about it. But the truth is, it's, it's a plague. Um, and it really actually ends up starting with the platforms. It really ends up starting with, if you're talking about influencer programming, what information does the influencer actually get on conversion rate? Or does an influencer even understand how many conversions they're driving? Mm -hmm. You see a lot of influencers now trending towards like affiliate programming because it's measurable. Someone clicked my particular link and I have driven X number of sales and they're being smart and betting on themselves and getting commission checks on that. So on the influencer side, it's a little bit easier because you just shift the model slightly. On the on the team side or even you know more complicated when we get into the league side, it becomes really difficult um, because you're effectively an aggregate. You have your own destinations that are owned and operated, but then you have all these nuanced relationships with a variety of different players or influencers. Not every right is the same. Not every deliverable <laughs> sure. is the same. So you're, ha you're effectively having to quantify something <clears throat> that becomes really challenging. And then there's the lack of conversation between the actual partner and the team. Teams have a historical issue of overpromising. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> In the interest of revenue. Um, but then the problem becomes cyclical. And yeah. now they've set a bad precedence. They set a bad standard. What we really need to focus on um, in the industry is actually operating like platforms ourselves. Okay. Um, and that requires a lack of dependency or reduction in dependency on platforms you don't own the data in. Uh, Twitch has a lot of information um, that they don't share with the teams. That's a big problem. It's a huge problem. So and does. So do every, and I, I think this is the thing, too. It's not like data is not being collected this is an entirely digital ecosystem and so if you were to tell somebody hey we've got this global ecosystem and everything is done digitally but we don't have any data people would say 
I have no idea what you're talking about. We've long gone are the days in esports where we can sell on conviction and reach. Um, yeah. It's coming. It's burgeoning. And well, it's it's we're a little bit past that. We have to get a little bit smarter. I think we've seen some great examples. I think the guys over at, at Tribe have done amazing work. I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it's less about diversification and more about stability. So I'd like to see less teams like getting into everything and really focusing on how do you operationalize your business so that each each influencer, each player, or each own and operated extension of your business has a directly managed P and L. Yeah, I mean, it's just that maturity needs. We need to get there and fast um, because I think business is getting a little bit tired of of that lack of information and. Then they go out on their own, and then you become an invited party to something that they're doing versus you could have worked in collaboration and created that yourself as an own and operated extension. And that's yeah. what I really hope we start seeing is um, what do esports organizations, leagues, players themselves really drive from a business results perspective? Mm -hmm. And if you're finding that there's a gap in your your delivery and the expected results, then it's probably a gap that exists because of the way that you've structured your infrastructure. For example, how much of your audience can you reach out to? By email or via SMS text messaging or, uh -huh. or even by a snail mail. It doesn't really matter how much of your audience is directly managed. And if the answer is sub 10% or it's limited to Discord or something along those lines, mm -hmm. you've truly done a disservice to yourself and, and really the industry because um, sports teams have it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the actual leagues that you've, you participate in have it for the most part. Um, so it's, it's just time for that upgrade. It's time for that upgrade. And I think, uh, we're a little late to it, honestly. Yeah. You know, something that was really surprising to me, I was at GameStop for about two and a half years. And when I had this fancy title with this big company with a lot of revenue in a vibrant category, obviously the network blew up. Right. So I made a lot of connections, um, early on, you know, this first six months, oh my gosh, you have this role for this company in this category. You know, I got to know, I got to get in touch with you, blah, blah, blah. Just about a year after, I was already hearing from brands and agencies, hey, I hear this esports thing isn't quite what we thought it was. Hmm. And it's like, well, first of all, yeah, magic doesn't really exist. So there's that thing, you know, yeah. the silver bullet <laughs> sort of a thing. But you're exactly right as far as, you know, these these practices. So you talked a little bit about you should be operating as a platform. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about like what does that actually mean and <laughs> and you know how do you do that at a at a high level? Oh, what a great question. I think <clears throat> we have to start considering all of all of those in that list of influencers, teams, leagues, etc., understanding that you've placed yourself effectively on a pedestal. Um, and it's, it's the responsibility to act like it. So being a platform means more than having content distribution or having an audience. It really needs to be a delivery mechanism for something of value. Um, okay. And if it's always competitive broadcast or if it's always, um, you know, fun and engaging content, then you've, you've missed the boat. I think we've seen dabbling. We've seen folks get into like um, PC parts or apparel or different things like that. Mm -hmm. But they it's always um, a little bit more of an afterthought. There's an intentional gap um, between an eSports team and Twitch. And the yeah. gap really rests in information. You have to own your full funnel. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of influencers who've started doing this. You look at whether it's Mr. Beast or someone like that where they've taken their brand IP, which started really in fun and engaging content, yeah. and they've continued to place that on a higher tier each time. And all of a sudden, he's got QSR destinations. All of a sudden, he's got directly managed community. He's got his own infrastructure that is not dependent on YouTube. It's not dependent on any of those things. And that's really yeah. what a platform is, is it's differentiated positioning within the marketplace that, mm. that isolates you as a microcosmic enterprise. Um, and I think that's that's the most important piece of, of becoming a platform is that it stands on its own, the reduction of dependencies. Um, that's what we need to see more of. And I think there's only, there's very few exceptions, FaZe being one of them. Um, I think 100 Thieves is on their way there. Okay. Um, but then you start to get into this weird world of now we're seeing all these IPOs, now we're seeing all the uh -huh. SPACs and things like that popping up. Is that the right avenue? Time will tell. Um, yeah. But the, the more encouraging piece is that they're no longer dependent on, um, say, a Twitch or a YouTube or any individual creator. Those yep. brands stand up on their own. 
Well, one of the, the themes that I've seen recently is, so you have these esports teams leaning way more into the content with influencers. It's almost like you have competitive teams as an excuse to be an esports org to get that kind of, to be in the category. Mm. And then you drive everything through influencers and your content creators. Additionally, you're seeing some of these uh, these loyalty programs pop up. Yeah. So Liquid started one. Mm-hmm. Envy has Envious. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on those moves? So the loyalty program is really exciting. On the first point, uh, we've actually gone up and down on this one okay where it was all competitive and there were no such things as content creators and then you know the early days of trick shotters and things like that and then it really got aggressive with the advent of youtube and then justin tv turned into twitch yeah that's what really accelerated it and there was people who you know cream always rises to the top it's capitalism and so we saw people really going after those individuals as a way to they become the catalysts of growth for the for the whole collective organization no one's not guilty of that i mean you see the over prioritization of people who are performant. Um, so I think that's a, it's another one of those examples of dependencies. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, if you look at a traditional sports property like the Dallas Cowboys, mm-hmm. the Dallas Cowboys can ship out player after player after player after player. The legacy remains. Yes. And I think that's what we're talking about with platform positioning. Okay. Um, it, re- it completely reduces the reliance. That's brand. Well, and that's a big difference uh, in esports compared to traditional sports. So I'm a San Francisco 49er fan, mm-hmm. born and raised in California. Now, I have been able to acclimate to going to Cowboys games, especially <laughs> yeah. complexity if you're trying to put me in that suite again. Um, I will wear the T-shirt, you know. The first time I, I was taken to a game, maybe you were in that suite with mm-hmm. us even, and uh, I remember being, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at, like, understanding, like, when the schmooze needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I went, I was at the Star, and they have that big Nike Cowboys. And I went with my friend, and I was just like cringing. You know, I was like, oh, I got to buy a cowboy shirt. Mm. Dude, now I wear it. Well, number one, it's a super comfortable like Nike dry fit shirt. So yeah. now I wear it all the time. Yep. Fine. That's a tangent. Anyway, <laughs> but what you see with traditional sports yeah. is people are fans of the team mm. first. Super right? Team. Like if Zeke goes to the New York Jets or whatever, all the people who wear his jersey today aren't going to start cheering for the Jets. Now, they wouldn't cheer for the Jets for a number of reasons. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, they're, his fans don't follow him. They stay with the team, and they're going to cheer for whoever's on that team. That's right. In esports, historically, fans are fans of the player over the team. Yep. And so what I heard from all of these owners who I was talking to was, boy, this creates a lot of challenges because the player knows it. Mm-hmm. The team knows it. And so you've got, you know, your top Call of Duty player or whatever. And you're like, hey, we need to do this appearance. We need to do this content, do this thing. Hey, man. What's in it for I'm me? I'm not really feeling it. Yep. And I might just leave and take my 2 million followers with me. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, please don't. Here's another 15% pay raise. And then the cycle continues. I mean, that's the power dynamic we're in right now. The teams are, are in a really disadvantageous position as are a a lot of the event organizers as are you know much of the ecosystem around it um and i think that's that's one thing that we typically try to ignore um because players are are going to come and go it's the nature of any sport yeah um and they do contribute to, meaningfully towards the the building of that legacy but if they are the entirety of the legacy yeah it becomes really really dangerous and that's also true for the you know i don't want to call it a boys club but the kind of core group of influential business leaders inside of esports have kind of had this protective shell for a long period of time. And if you're not one of those 16 folks, it it becomes hard to create something of substance um, that's going to stand the test of time. And I think where we've, where we've kind of lost our way a little bit um, is taking the proper steps to build sustainability. Yeah. Um, versus the kind of quick cash grabs that we've all been after for a pretty long period of time, which is still pretty prevalent. Yeah, we were talking about this on the phone Mm -hmm. yesterday as we were preparing for this episode. What we're talking about is we've got a a pretty cosmetic industry, I would say. Superficial. If you see kind of what this industry is all about, it's not a criticism, it's just an observation, observation, is simply it's very front-facing. You've got an industry of people who grew up on social media, Mm -hmm. and even the people who are background people 
they be they still go to the forefront, mm-hmm. right? It's all about like if you see the people like Optic who like it's like the cameraman's got two hundred twenty four thousand followers. It's like, all right, mm-hmm. now that's awesome, good for him, that's amazing, but it's not the cameraman just being the cameraman and being the best cameraman he wants to be an influencer (laughs) yeah and so you have the whole industry it seems basically it's a generalization but wants to be influencers and there is little satisfaction especially in this instant gratification world that we live in sure and being the person in the background learning how to build the infrastructure how to do the unsexy things that aren't going to get likes on social media or get shares but and this is why i'm always so interested to talk to you you're one of these people who seems to be fulfilled with being in the background it seems and you've learned these things you've spent the time and you've transitioned your learnings from other agency or other industries agency brand team etc to the space do you think that the reason why we don't have this background infrastructure is it's a young industry because a cultural thing like the social media aspect or something else? It's probably a combination. I don't think you pin it to one thing. I mean, I think Wall Street would be really concerned if every CEO of every Fortune 1 or 5 out there was having their own podcast and talking about uh, con- you know, confrontational or controversial issues on a regular basis and things like that. The street wouldn't stand for it. Stock prices would plummet and people would be really concerned. It's really <laughs> unique. Point. It's really unique in this industry to have so many uh, business leaders, and I use air quotes not in a facetious way, but in an actual way, business leaders needing to be front and center. Streaming live. I, on a regular basis, and there's been a lot of fallout things. People yeah. are overly exposed. Business is in a boardroom. You know, business isn't for, it's for to be discussed on a podcast like this, Mm -hmm. but it really, that backend infrastructure is the, is the problem. It's the antidote Mm -hmm. Um, to a lot of the things that we're seeing. I think it's laughable if you were to side by side our industry with, with traditional industries, just because of our expectations as the consumer for the CEO. And then they're ostracized when they're not. So if you're not that front facing CEO, if you're not that front facing um, team owner or league owner or whatever, then you're like, man, that guy really doesn't come out much or nobody knows who that guy is. He's, he's a nobody. And it's yeah. like, I've, I've really enjoyed working on the back end. My, my joy working in esports is an event like, you know, race to world first breaking records or delivering supreme value to an audience that's otherwise been marginalized as a, you know, uh, I mean, wow gets so much, uh, negative, um, connotation associated with it because of the way sure. that it's played. But it was really nice to see that level of engagement, that level of sponsorship, that level of viewership from something like that. And it was from not the investment of, of course, the players invest a ton in it, but that's not the point. The point is, is there were 20, 30 people who were night and day, 24 hours a day building that infrastructure so that it could be a success. A lot of the time we deprioritize the journey in the interest of the destination. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what's really missing in esports and in, in the education around it, in gaming overall, uh, because of the focus on influencers. One in three kids, their career path and vision is to be a creator and influencer. Not many of you are going to go go after that and hit that. In the right. way that you're that a Tim the Tapman or a Lupo or or whoever else it might be yeah, hits it, of people. Yeah. but there's an incredibly gratifying career path if you shift your expectations to reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've met my favorite people in esports. To be honest with you, aren't necessarily the players, and I've met a lot of them, and they're yeah. a lot of them are great. Some of them are not, <laughs> but the best people are the videographers who are on a 16-hour flight, pull a 12-hour day, deliver mm-hmm. footage on time, and start to edit it in advance, and then they're working on additional skills on the side. Sure, it's a 24/7 industry, and we only really pay attention to the one, one and one that one day, one hour stream, and that's a disservice to the future and the progress and all those things. And it really does start with those business leaders who have such a desire to be giving an opinion. Mm-hmm. But to your point at the at the outset of the question is that's a superficial opinion and it really doesn't appreciate the reality of it. There is a budget. There is an Excel sheet that you have to be aware of. There is a grueling day ahead of you in those pitch decks to get those sponsorship deals to stay afloat right. and to try to renegotiate an exclusive media rights deal with Twitch so that you can stay alive for the next year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and 
that's the stuff I wish we talked about more. Right. I think kids would see a vision for themselves in the industry beyond player and player dumb and creator side. And there are really fruitful and engaging careers that come from that businesses. Some of the best innovations we've seen came from someone saying, I think there's a missing point here. Why aren't there position specific metrics in Counter-Strike? You know, right. why aren't there position specific metrics or training modules or real feeder systems that aren't cash grabs themselves? Mm -hmm. It's not a feeder system to put on a series of events and select one finalist as a new member of a team. That's not a feeder system. Yeah. I think the real victims in this whole thing are the administrators trying to build leagues. And mm -hmm. trying to figure it out on their own because there are no resources. Do you know how expensive it is to put up an esports lab in a high school to try to develop and nurture talent and growth? And right. you know, I think that's the stuff that we just overlook so frequently. And it's it's um, I, that's the thing that I get most excited about is when I see a kid in like a pitch day and he's like, "We have an idea for this," um, and and you see the passion, the intensity, and the heart and soul that went into it. All it needs is a little bit of reality a little bit of of business sense to it and those would sure. be super valuable advancements and and pieces of progress yeah so you know you've shared here how okay you've spent the time to learn this back end stuff you found fulfillment in that yeah uh what can you share to help us here you know build up this next generation you're mm. talking about nobody talks about this so yeah. let's talk about it let's make this <laughs> piece of content you know what's missing in the industry right yeah so tell me a little bit Two things. One is, how did you gain this uh, knowledge and this appreciation? Sure. And number two, you know, what are some tips for some younger people who are in high school or college uh, that we can say, look, this is a path you can pursue? Mm. Man, so, you know, I've always always played games. You know, I think the pivotal moment was when they told me I wasn't going to be on the, the varsity basketball team for obvious reasons. Um, and I, We do see eye to eye. We do. <laughs> so so I poured that desire for competition into gaming used to run like you know ready to rumble uh like evening leagues and and fifa evening leagues like 20 dollars buy-ins and yeah it was able to kind of fuel that intensity for me <clears throat> and then fast forward it was assigned a really lame junior project when i was at ueg on the agency side of you know just run an audit of sports agencies where's the white space and you know there's oracles and wmes and and utas and things like that you're not really going to win in yeah. sports, but esports was is 2015 at the time is pretty early. So to back up really quick there, yeah. so your, was your first job at an agency? So right out of fresh out of school, I went to Edelman on the PR side because I thought you could change the world in PR, and was mortified to find out that you could. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but for a junior a junior in PR, it's a lot of media list cold call and pitching, and just yeah. didn't feel right. And they, they actually merged Edelman's Matter Inc. with UTA mm -hmm. to create UEG. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I got to the entertain entertainment, sports, and lifestyle space. Yeah, agency within 30 days of graduating right out of school. But first, cool. for the kids, I did a traineeship, unpaid traineeship, and then yeah. I did uh, a marginally paid um, that really only covered the cost of the commute for um, the first first three months before I was brought on full time. Share a little bit about the value of the unpaid <laughs> you know what's funny is they try to get you to leave i think my mm. the the truth is is uh time in is the difference in everything you know i think uh malcolm gladwell in uh, i believe it's outliers talks about ten thousand hours right um and some of it's circumstantial in what you have access to but nothing stops you these days from getting those ten thousand hours in yeah. i had such a hunger you know, first one in, last one to leave. I sat in meetings I didn't need to be in, gave recaps on those meetings. They probably didn't even need the information I was sharing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be in everything and all things all the time. Um, and that's probably lesson number one is Ancora Amparo. I mean, that's, that's yet I am still learning is the mentality that we should all have. So what helped you develop that? Was that kind of a, just a natural curiosity or did your parents breed that in you? Did you see it somewhere else? You know, it's funny. It's hard to pinpoint in an exact moment. I think I've always been curious, you know, like just curious. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what really spurred it on was the observation of my old man, um, you know, didn't didn't go through the traditional track and get a master's from Wharton or anything like that. Very different. But I watched him go from someone who was drafting at the steel yards to someone who did store design to the CMO and CIO of a, of a fortune 500 second largest apparel lifestyle holding company in the world. Well, wow. that'll put some, a chip on your shoulder and put you in a shadow. Sure. Um, and then you want to make a name for yourself. And so finding what that was and, and finding where my sweet spot would be was really what drove it. And then of course, um, 
personally, my son was born when I was about 19. So that's a nice kick, a nice kick in the pants to, yeah. to get off to get off your butt and do something about it. So it's a combination of, I think, cultural context and timing and opportunity uh-huh. that really drove it more than anything else. So I was going to work harder than everybody else in that room, even though I wasn't getting paid. There you go. So, okay, let's go back to the agency where mm-hmm. you were. So you're at that agency and then what, where'd you go next? Yeah. So I, I get this, this assignment to, uh, study sports and the sports agency dy- dynamic. I did that, delivered it and said, Hey, let me take a shot at this. We did the Toyota Overwatch League deal, which was the first, uh, full season auto sponsorship. I want to dig into that a little bit. We can. Because I think that that was amazing. Mm. I, I thought that was one of the better brand activations that I've seen. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. I designed all the in-stadium signage, by the way, personally. Well, that's not the part I appreciated. <laughs> but <laughs> this is what I thought was so great about the Toyota thing was essentially, for people who aren't familiar with the activation, was uh, casters were picking up players and taking them to the Blizzard Arena. Yep. And it was this unique situation for people who don't understand how Overwatch League started, where the first year all the teams were playing in Blizzard Arena. Mm-hmm. So they're all located there. So they just go into the same place over and over and over again. They had the geographically located teams, but there was nothing in those cities. It was all in LA. Yep. And we can dig into what how what we at GameStop did with Envy and these other teams with watch parties. Yep. But I love I, I'm a big believer that there's organic uh, campaign opportunities for non endemic brands, almost everybody. Yep. Not everybody. I don't think it works for everybody. But I do think it's cust- it's customized. It's it they're one offs. Yeah. And so there are evaluate what does the industry need. Mm. And sometimes that's just entertainment. It's, sometimes you just need great entertainment. Sometimes you need experiences physically enhanced. And that's what I loved about the GameStop Performance Center with right. complexity. But it has to make sense organically with your brand. Mm. So, and it can't be just like, blah, here's my brand. So the fact that these Toyota spots were casters who talk for a living, so they're good at it. Yeah, wasn't too bad. They're naturally picking up the players, which is like, yeah, the players have to go from the hotel to Blizzard Arena. That's cool. You're in a car. You're in a Toyota. Mm. That makes sense. And it's just like really interesting content that you probably wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. I thought it was great. It was just one of those things of the actual, the hardest part about it was making sure that it wasn't like egregious. Like it wasn't like Toyota, 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 Toyota. That's, right? yeah, and, what you got to avoid, yeah. And I think the team over there, you know, Anthony and um, that whole team that was under Josh Sella for a while was just really uh, instrumental in, in defining what that looked like, but also <clears throat> not losing the real value for the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, we did that. We did that first deal. They renewed the second deal. Um, and they've been like a pretty good mainstay. I think the biggest outcome from that was actually the fan response because it wasn't egregious because the players yeah. were sharing insights on those rides and there was a little smack talk, um, mm-hmm. about the upcoming match and those things were what they wanted. And so yeah. it was, it was that sweet spot in the Venn diagram between the fan, the brand and the league that we, we did a good job on. There's always key learnings and things like that, but that was, that was something I'm, we're pretty proud of. It's the first full season auto sponsorship in esports history. Wow. Um, and that actually transpired into doing the first, um, the first time an OLP with FIFA was allowed to do a FIFA sponsorship for the game with um, Kiwi Shoe Care at SC Johnson was the other one that we did all within the same three months of UEG's first, uh, foray into esports. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. So did you work with other brands at that agency or then did you take a yeah. the next step? Yeah, no, we worked we worked uh with PepsiCo a ton. I was on that business for four years, worked on SC Johnson for two years, uh Allstate, um some smaller startups. Just I've worked on about eighty five brands during my time at, at uh UEG. Um only about fifteen of them broached the topic of esports and only about five of them actually took the first steps. So it's mm-hmm. a smaller conversion rate and percentage. But those that did have never left it. Um, and that that was the most important insight leaving there. So actually, I actually got a big for my britches. Said, "Give me VP title in an esports practice with a team of three, and let me run it." And they said, "But then you wouldn't be doing everything else you're doing." And I said, "That's kind of the point." <laughs> and then we just, right. you know, amicably parted ways, and I ended up starting doing some consulting. And that's when I landed at Complexity about six months later. Yeah. So I, I want you to tell you why I think there's been this rise in esports in the U.S. For mm. the, in the last five six years and. You tell me if you agree or you disagree. Sure. So I believe that it's primarily youth marketing. And so brands, agencies, traditional sports, they all see that millennials and younger 
are no longer watching programmatic television. They're no longer participating or watching traditional sports. And they say, what is everybody doing? Oh, they're playing video games. Well, I'll be the first one to tell you video games, non-competitive video games, are incredibly difficult to integrate in, especially when the, the consumer requires you to do it organically. Mm -hmm. It's like if you are a modern brand, how do you integrate into Red Dead Redemption 2? Mm -hmm. Not easy, <laughs> no. right? And I also don't know that like Ariat is like, you know, having boots in the game is the right play, right? right? So <clears throat> it's very challenging. And they say, okay, well, what do we do? And then they see these headlines. Oh, more people watch this, than you know, Super tournament Bowl. than the Super mm -hmm. Bowl. There's 100,000 people in Poland in this arena. There's blah, 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 all this, the 500 million esports enthusiasts, however you define that today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... This is the thing. And so these marketers see familiar, sponsorable assets, mm -hmm. teams, leagues, venues, content, jerseys, so many opportunities for logo placement. Yeah. Right? And mm -hmm. they say, I know this world. I've done this in the NBA, the MLB, the NFL. I know how to do this. And then they do what they did there and they find out it's not accepted. Oh, and they got disappointed. And not yeah. only are you not accepted, but then you're black listed you go famous on reddit and twitter for mm -hmm. all the wrong reasons and there's a big disappointment there's a lot of confusion but that is my perspective it all comes down to youth marketing trying to chase the eyeballs and get in front of the people that they are used to being in front of and saying it's video games and esports is our channel do you agree or disagree or add context to that so you know what i think it was that I think it was that, but that t it totally disregards legacy parents like ourselves. I think it, uh -huh. it disregards how that the people who we would originally have thought of this like, ah, oh, holy grail of audience, they're aging up, yeah. you know, and we're all getting, I'm 33, like we're all yeah. getting older now. And so you, you miss entire demographics when you just observe it as youth marketing. Um, but also I think it's, it's the, it's the truth, but it's also the problem. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's so many opportunities to create innovative programming that is sponsored or branded as such. And we've kind of exchanged it. I mean, we've got one of the most fast, fast evolving, innovative industries. And to your point, we've limited most of brand placements to logos yeah. um, or, or even, you know, not to our credit or discredit, you know, naming rights or mm -hmm. um, shoulder content, like what's the true value extraction? You know, when you think of something like, I know it's a little fresh, um, but the the kind of sex in the city Peloton thing that just happened over the over the last couple of days, you know, it's it's interesting to see. It's interesting to see a brand like that take what is someone having a spoiler alert, someone having a heart attack and then turning it into a positive for the brand. Like yeah. we're missing those opportunities of, of intelligence, but it's because on the brand side, someone over then says, Hey, this is happening. It's trending. We should do it. I know nothing about it, but I have a friend who has a friend who works at this agency who knows this team. And then they, they make the partnership like four layers removed, five steps removed from the actual the actual brand to the team or brand to the player or whatever that might be. And you get this like hodgepodge, um, really poorly executed uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that you hear the most about like DHL, um, you know, yeah. having the box in the arena and having it actually be a substantial ad additive to the show, what Twitch and, and Amazon have done with actual drops and things like that and now influencers are able to do them themselves um those are the things that we should have we should be doing all the time i think the future for us really looks like okay if i buy a pair of shoes at Foot Locker and i get a credit do i get those shoes in nba 2k that's right. real additive value so i'm taking what is a physical this isn't a metaverse conversation yet i'm sure we'll get there <laughs> Um, but that's the type of thing I want brands to see is, is, is if I'm investing in you mm -hmm. as, as, as part of my identity, I want you to then become part of my extended identity. And I think right. that's what we're missing as what the audience really, really wants is brands to play a role in providing uh, value cachet 
um, a return on my investment into the brand. And I think that's, yeah. you know, that's the thing that we really, it's not more content or how to's or, you know, logo placements. It's, it's actually substantive investment into who I am, what I care about and who I follow. Um, that's yeah. Important. And I think uh, something that, you know, it's part of the reason why NFTs are such a big question mark for a lot of people is because it's hard for older generations of people to wrap their heads around the fact that young people see value in digital goods. Mm. And so you go back to the the traditional, the golden gun, right? Yeah. Oh, like, why are you paying all this money for a golden gun? Older generations are going to say, that's not exclusive. <laughs> it's digital. They can make as many of them as possible, yep. right? And this is even before blockchain, yeah. you know, it's, it's just, it's really high priced. Well, obviously with blockchain, then you can, you know, you can track this stuff mm -hmm. and um, have a, what, non-fungible piece of, am I even saying that right? You did it. You got it. Okay, non-fungible token. We'll, fi yeah. we'll fix that in post. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the, when you talk about the physical and the digital combination, that, those are some of my, my favorite activations. Oh, in yeah. fact, Adidas did something with FIFA mm -hmm. that as you did things physically with the shoes, you gained credits oh, or, yeah. or things in the game. And... It can be a struggle, and I'd love to get some of your insight on this, for most brands are physical items, right? Yeah. Your shoes, your chips, your soda, whatever. The consumer that you are trying to reach values digital goods. Mm -hmm. And so how can you give them what they want and in a way that feels organic, get what you want, which is sales of your product? Yeah. You know, it's an exchange <clears throat> and a lot of, we, we talk so negatively about like quid pro quo, uh -huh. right? Like you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Sure. That's honestly how we need to treat the esports audience. One of my favorite examples is actually has nothing to do with fans and more so has to do with the relationship between a publisher and teams. And I personally think that EA's FIFA, to your point around the Adidas example, but even further than that, the invitation that they gave to teams that have invested in their leagues and invested in paying players to participate in their competitive environment, uh -huh. the exchange was like, hey, we're going to put your jerseys in game and we're going to allow your fans to represent you anytime cool. they're playing the game, right? That was, there was no, there, I, I didn't pay them, they didn't pay us. It was mm -hmm. nothing, it was nothing along those lines. There was a mutual interest in that perpetuation. And I think that's the thing that we should start seeing from, from brands in that same way or anybody who wants to invest in the space. You know, we, I talk a lot about, um, especially when I was in my time at Complexity, about, um, the financial understanding that players, teams, kids coming up through the systems have about how leagues operate or how they can how they can develop and grow credit system, how to build credit, how to build wealth, how to invest your earnings from whatever you might be participating in. Mm -hmm. It's you know, for someone like, let's say, a TD Ameritrade or or someone like that Bank of America Merrill Lynch to come in and have educational programs, I think Experian's done some pretty interesting work recently with Boost and some of the other work that they're doing. But... <clears throat> You can actually provide something of value in a playful, engaging way that has both a digital and physical extension. We're not talking about rocket science at all. It's, right. it's the same thing that we've been seeing evolve in the shift in the economy overall. Don't just sell an NFT. I thought the Golden State Warriors did a beautiful activation. They sold an NFT that was all six or whatever, sorry, Golden State Warriors fans, all of their championship rings converted into a bracelet. The mm -hmm. purchase of the NFT was at auction for charity and the recipient didn't just get the NFT, they got the an experience, they got to have a training session, they got to go to the stadium, they got a one-on-one -on -one meet and greet. Yeah. Like it's, it's the bundling of things of interest that need to be packaged together and I think we always see it, to your point earlier, in a very superficial way. If we got the logo there or if someone bought the jersey or whatever right. that might be, it stops there. Well, I think it comes down to an others first mentality. Mm. I remember it was at GameStop uh, during one of our annual planning meetings. We got marketing together, merchandising together. Mm. It was a long day. Yep. And we got our leaders just going through the plan. And I remember vividly the it wasn't the CMO at the time, but the person under the CMO, CMO in waiting essentially. Mm. Um I remember at the end she said, and that's what we want to do this year. And I remember thinking, does that what our is that what our customers want us to do this year? Mm. And did we How even, dare you? And did we even consider that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so we typically, I mean, as a brand, you know, so, so focused 
on this is my KPI. I want to drive this. I want to drive this. I want to drive this. I think there's a lot to understanding that your KPI may be the byproduct mm. of you serving a community. Mm. In fact, I've never shared this um, you know, on a podcast or anything, but I, I've shared it with a number of people in private conversations. Once again, again at GameStop, you know, their, uh, I don't want to say their core competency, but one of the advantages that they saw was that we have stores everywhere. Mm-hmm. When I was there, we had 3,700 stores across America. And I think the statistic is there's one store within an eight minute drive of 90% of the population. Mm. It's convenience, right? Convenience is king. However, you know what's a lot more convenient than driving eight minutes? Ordering on Amazon. Mm. You know what's more convenient than that? Downloading it directly on the dash yep. or from your PC, right? I was afraid we might get here. So this is what I was sharing at the time. And I'm not here to say boo GameStop. I love those people and I loved my time there. I'm a big fan of everybody there. But this is an important, you know, moment of reality to recognize. I said, look, if you're playing the convenience game, you're going to lose. Mm-hmm. Because you're not the most convenient. In fact, you could argue that a retail purchase for a video game is the least convenient way to purchase a video game. It doesn't matter how many physical stores you have. Hmm. You know the one thing that overrules convenience? You think about all the things that convenience overrules. We give up our privacy. We do everything for convenience, Hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's one thing that is king over convenience, and it's love. Hmm. And I said... When people answer, why did I buy Call of Duty from GameStop? It can't be, oh, because they're close to my house. Because it was convenient. (laughs) Right. The answer should be, because I love the brand. Mm. It should be, oh my gosh, I got to go to the GameStop Performance Center and meet so-and-so, learn how to train like a pro. Uh, The content they put out helped me get better at the game. This, that, and the other. Like, man, they have supported me. They support our community. I love those guys. That's where I'm going to get my game. Yeah. That has to be the answer. It's customer centricity. I mean, that's the primary difference we're talking about here is is you have to be something to be loved. Mm. It's not limited to GameStop. It's it's that's of course. it's it's really effectively true about everyone. Um but it also starts with accurate to your point accurate data and reporting. What do we know? What do we know? You know, mm-hmm. how do you, what questions are you answering? What consumer challenges? I mean, the people look at things like the jobs needing to be done framework and, and some of those things is, is the observation that consumers hire you for a function. Yeah. Consumers hire your product to solve a need that they have or a job that needs to be done. And if you're wrong about the job that needs to be done that you provide, or if you're hazy on it or inaccurate, then so is your data, so is the performance, and then you're sitting there scratching your head going, well, why didn't this work? Yeah. Well, let's let's look at what transpired here. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's systemic. It's a bit of a disease. Uh, I think it's a byproduct in esports of us not knowing who the consumers are. Mm-hmm or not appreciating what they actually observe. I mean, when was the last time you heard of an esports team issuing a survey to their to their audience and and in as part of their email programming or loyalty program? Right. Or or giving something of substance back for having a cyclical feedback loop where they can identify issues that they can solve and things like that. It's not prevalent enough. Yeah. Because we deem it as boring. Oh, that's what traditional sports or that's what the old guys do. It's mm-hmm. like, well, they were on to something. At least they There's they, a reason they've been doing it for 101 years. I mean, it's there's the, you know, we can ignore it, we can disacknowledge it, we can just host another series of content or just another tournament or we can understand what they liked the most about that tournament. Was right. it the shoulder programming? Was it the engagement? Was there some interactive element? Did they get something of value out of it? Did it make them better people? Did it make them better players? Did they feel like they made a meaningful contribution to the ecosystem or community that's being developed around this IP? You know, I think that's the stuff that we just don't measure. Um, Mm. I think GameStop measures it, but I don't think teams measure it. And I certainly don't think players measure it. But the technology exists. It does. And it exists with Maestro. It does. Right? (laughs) And so this is one of the things we we talked a long time ago with the Esports Trade Association Mm -hmm. and these other things, looking for opportunities to, you know, for Maestro, mm-hmm. 
And one of the things that you helped me understand, I mean, one of the problems like we've talked about in this digital ecosystem is everything's digital, but nothing's measured. Well, things are measured, they're not shared. That's right. Right? So Twitch is holding on to their data. Mm -hmm. Microsoft's holding on to their Xbox data. PlayStation's holding on to theirs, right? And you need to understand your audience. If you understand who your audience is, how to interact with them, that's how you win. Yeah. Right. And so how does Maestro accomplish that? So what's nice is it's <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, I think it's it's nice to see people observing the gap. I mean, the, the other part of it is there's a tremendous amount of value for Twitch or YouTube or Microsoft or whoever it might be in withholding that information. It's additional beats. They can release a quarterly report, yeah. get a bunch of fresh PR out of it, which no, is awesome. It's not on accident. It, it's, it's definitely <laughs> yeah, intentional. They're doing it. Yeah, it's, it's true. I think the. It also creates dependency intentionally. Um, so one of the things I'm most proud of that we do at, at Maestro, which is really from a core competency perspective, merging the worlds of content, commerce, and community into kind of one owned and operated experience where the IP rights holder or the content owner really gets access to everything, not just the data, but the direct the direct engagement with the audience itself, the ways in which they can monetize, whether it's ticketed or subscription-based or some type of hybrid of the two. Um, it really, you know, we've had everyone from Overwatch League, Epic's Fortnite Championship Series uh, is on is on Maestro, um, but so is Melissa Etheridge, so is 21 Pilots, Billie Eilish has done shows with Maestro. Yeah. You know, and, and they're all seeing the same thing, which is if I directly own, manage, uh, monetize, and continue re recurring engagement with an audience, I become the actual owner of that uh, audience versus if you if you truly break it down, you rent your audience from Twitter, you rent your audience from Instagram. It's technically their audience and they choose and their algorithms choose when you get placed. And so right. you don't even actually have full visibility into how the algorithm's going to place you, your core audience uh, might not even actually see your post that day because the algorithm saw something more important than you trending. And so it's actually your audience that suffers. So I think yeah. one of the things we've, we've built into the product is our community dashboard and management systems. I mean, answer this question this is an interesting one. When was the last time you heard of an esports team or influencer using a customer relationship management system or a CRM, like as a database? There's probably a couple I know because I'm close to some of the you know, more savvy run businesses. Yeah. But I would say it's rare. It's definitely rare. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that they, I mean, you ask a question like, are you using, what are you on Salesforce, HubSpot, Clavio? What are you, what are you using right now? And they'll be like, uh, Google, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of scary. So one of the things we have in our community, our community dashboard is you have all of their direct email addresses, all of their direct Facebook information, their demographic data. You can right. see what they bought, you know, whether it was a ticket or actual your merch or whatever that might be, how many times they engaged with chat or, or clicked on an overlay or <clears throat> participated in some type of gamified uh, quest or, or leaderboard submission or whatever that might be. And the crazy thing is I've been a client twice mm. of Maestro before I ever joined. We were a client at, at Complexity. We were a client when I was at OnePlus. Um, and in both instances, the value of the actual event was great. Mm. But the value of the data that came from the event was significantly greater than that because most of the time we don't recognize this. It is much more efficient to retain an active and engaged customer than it is to acquire a new to one. Acquire a new one. It's that's yeah. like. I know. mean, every product knows that you spend so much more money to get somebody than to keep somebody. Does every product know it? You know, does he, do, do, do you know do do orgs realize it? Do do the properties and associated businesses around esports recognize it? The apparel companies probably do. Mm -hmm. um, the leagues probably do, but do the teams and the well, players? Well, I would point it too to their their bread and butter, which is the partnerships. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot more time and effort and money to get that sponsorship than to keep it, right? Because what do you guys do? You guys start over again. And if you're not delivering on that ROI, they're going to pull their money and they're going to go elsewhere. And th I mean, the most terrifying thing, I keep going to my GameStop days, but this is what got me to join the Esports Trade Association. This is what got me to you know start this podcast and try to share the these issues and try to help solve them is realizing you've got a $1 billion global industry that the vast majority of it is partnership revenue and the people who are funding the industry are not receiving the reason why they're funding it. Mm -hmm. 
And it's important. I think a lot of times in the esports industry, we can say, why aren't people supporting us? Or why isn't this? It's like, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. You know why people sponsor stuff? It's because they make more money if they do it than they don't. Or more money if they sponsor that than if they sponsor yeah. something else. Yeah. Like, I used to, I have a, yeah. understand this because of my skateboarding background. So I've been a sponsored skateboard since 14. I remember there was, I think I, I went a lot further in my skateboarding because of my understanding of my role as a brand ambassador mm -hmm. more than even my ability on the board. <laughs> and there was a time I used to skate for Globe Shoes. And the guy who gave me shoes, he kicked everybody off the team except me at one point. And it was not international globe. It was like a smaller uh, Northern California rep. And he said, John, some people just think they're cool enough to get shoes. And that really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. You don't get a sponsor because you're cool. You get a sponsor because they make more money sponsoring you, spending money than they would if they didn't spend that money or if they spent it somewhere else. Yeah. And so while yes, we do want to set expectations, we want to help brands and agencies understand how to reach the space and blah, blah, blah. We also have to be honest and understand why are you sponsoring it? Yeah. To make money. The worst, we talk a lot about metrics and things like that. The, the worst performing metric in all of esports is ROI. It's it, by far Yikes. on the on the individual creator level, on the influencer level, on the team level, on the league level, because we don't measure it. <clears throat> so. Your, your example is such a powerful one, but it's it's so much more pervasive than that. Uh, you know, how many teams give away more merch than they sell? How many teams position that they sold something out when on the back end they only made 250 to begin with? You know, I of think course. there's there's a facade, there's a bravado that needs to kind of go away. And don't get me wrong, I love getting free stuff. Keep sending me free stuff. Yeah, um, but, same. <laughs> right? But the there's a point at which, like, the games need to stop. You know, I think we it, it centralize standardize, collaborate, collude even if you want to. We've seen mm -hmm. some light touch points, you know, whether it was PEA or, or whatever that might be, of starting to see some form of collective bargaining rights on the team level, but we can't get far enough out of our own ego and out of our own way to really see that stuff materialize. You know, yep. players are poorly represented. Players are abused. I mean, at the at every single level, <clears throat> Someone is, key, is someone is being taken advantage of. Mm. The creator is signed to an agency. The agency makes more than the creators do. And then the agency facilitates the deal with the team. The team facilitates the deal with the sponsorship. By the time the, the person responsible for the deliverable, for the execution, mm -hmm. gets their money, they're getting 10% of what everybody else does. Wow. Well, that seems predatory and off balance. Sure. And it's, you know, it's something's wrong there. It's, it's a byproduct of a negative infrastructure. It's a byproduct of... You know, the quick cash grab is an easy way to summarize it, but at the end of the day, it's because we have um, a tendency to cash the check first and then worry about the rest later. Yeah. Um, and I, it's 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 never gone away. The difference in your example is you felt a sense of urgency. Uh, the, I'm assuming a sense of kind of desperation to deliver. Right. Um, because someone had invested in you. And I think sure. we just have this tendency to read the headline of so-and-so did a multi-million dollar, you know, multi-year deal with whoever. Um, but then where's that follow-up story that never comes because the results yeah. weren't what they were intended to be. You know, and it's it, time yeah, to... Yeah, it shouldn't be viewed as, hey, I got a payday. I'm the man. Time to go celebrate. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's time for you to go to work. Oh, yeah. and that's... these people just paid you to deliver and now the real work begins yep. and it's not sexy it's not on instagram it's not always fun but it's the most important part of the job and one of the things i share when i talk to college classes is the world is run by nerds mm -hmm. you know what it's easy to put cool clothes on later mm -hmm. it's a lot harder and it takes a lot more time to learn how to do the work yep and appreciate it and right. enjoy it. Yeah, that's what we were talking about earlier. Is we get so worried about the headline and the destination, we forget about that that whole journey portion. And I think <clears throat> there's two things I always say to people about this is have an agency mentality. Mm -hmm. It's not your money. It's yep. not your revenue. It's, it's your legacy and character that's going to be defined by how well you execute against whatever it is that is your responsible, whether or not you mm. were involved in setting those expectations or otherwise. The second one is Plato's cave analogy. Okay. Esports as a whole is, is in the cave. 
there's no doubt in my mind they believe the shadows on the wall that are being put um you know by the people who are kind of crafting the narrative of what esports is bigger than the super bowl bigger than this thing well why is the super bowl ad revenue higher than esports in any sense of the in any way that you chop that up why do you think media rights dollars continue to go up for those things even though no one's watching tv there's there's a mechanism here there's an infrastructure here that unless you understand you're doomed to fail because those nerds Mm -hmm. that built those systems built it in a way where you can you can capitalize on that and you can develop return and so it's unfortunate that a lot of the times we marginalize those who have made it out of the cave or who maybe came from a different industry but have a passion for gaming and we're like well what do you know you haven't played in two years or what do you know you're not a gamer right you know and it's like we're killing ourselves with that that construct i remember when certain people ended up at the publisher side they were like oh great more traditional sports people and esports well can't hurt us yeah. you know as much as we feel like you can't teach esports or you can't teach a passion for gaming you can everything is absolutely is teachable so well, i think get out of the cave guys and it comes down to to me it comes down to intention mm. It's like, what is your intentions to get into this industry? Mm. Are you here for the gold rush? Are you here for the cash grab? Are you here, you know, between Bitcoin rising and falling? Because yeah. this is the, the hot new silver bullet, whatever. Mm-hmm. Or is this a community that you care about, that you want to see how you can help, and you'd like to grow with them? Yeah. And if it's the latter, you know, you're embraced. The former is losing its luster, mind all of us. Right. Like those, you know, I was there in the early days. I know how easy that pitch was. Mm-hmm. You know, projective viewership is X. You know, you're going to get this number of eyeballs. But all of a sudden we found out those are empty eyeballs or they're blind eyeballs or they're bot eyeballs. Right. You know, and I think that's the thing that we've we've really, truly done it to ourselves. And now that we normalize and stabilize and get some truth, esports is 40 plus games now. You right. know, you can't say, oh, esports is bigger than this. OK, so well, music's bigger than esports and sports Sports. is bigger than esports you know yeah, it's like i always use that sports yeah. analogy have you reached the sports audience yeah, you targeted it's seven sports. billion people globally yeah, like, what yeah. are we talking yeah that's wait is that the total that's the total population you know it's like yeah you know it's 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 observable ignorance um right. and it's acceptable and we like perpetuate it and we're excited by it and all of those things and it's really unfortunate to still see that this long in the industry and while it's immature it's had longer than nfts it's had longer than blockchain Right. You know, and they seem to figure it out at a, at a faster pace. And now we have to figure that out, right. you know, and, and we're not moving at a fast enough pace. And honestly, I think some of the dinosaur mentalities need to die out. I think we do need to age out some of the gatekeepers. You know, we call them in music with the old heads. Right. Sure. Or even in skateboarding, we call it like the OGs. Like, right. I mean, they, nobody knows who day one song is anymore. You know, like right. you're missing so much value if you don't learn you know, how Rodney Mullen spent four hours every day from the time he was two to flatland the way that he did. Yeah. You know, there's just, it's it's sad that we don't have that level of appreciation. Everybody knows Jason Lake, or most people know J- Jason Lake in esports. Right. You don't know, you don't know about 2008 and the bankruptcy that hit um, the leagues that he had invested in. You don't right. know the climbing out of the hole that that man went through, and, and that's what's hardened him in the way that he is and given him the perspective. Yeah. Failure breeds success faster than anything else, and I think we've been... Absolutely afraid to fail and we've lied our way through it and now the kind of chickens come to roost a little bit on that one well we stay grinding you mm-hmm. know we get the right people involved you know to figure these problems out oh yeah you know and i'm a big believer in you know not just poking the holes but finding ways to fill it and you're one of the people in the space who are really helping to fill it uh, as we reach the end of this episode yeah. what did i miss last five <laughs> minutes you know is there anything that we missed here that that, that is important to share with this audience? yeah man live for the grind I think mm-hmm. that's really it. I think you said it right here at the end of, is, is live for the grind. There's going to be 100-hour work, we- work weeks. Yeah. There's going to be that 16-hour flight. There's going to be that night where you don't know if you have enough in the tank. There's Those are the things. I want to see less instant gratification and less 9-to-5 mentality and things like that. I want to see more of purposeful purposeful grinding like don't don't get me wrong burnout's real and i'm not saying to not burn out but have an agency mentality yeah you know the thing that we talk about because we came up through those same kind of vehicles no one's going to give it to you the helping hands at the end of your wrist and if you want something then it's the difference between you and and someone else getting it is going to 
a lot of the times equate to the number of hours. Opportunity doesn't sleep. True. So that means sometimes you don't either. You know, if you really want this, if you really want to be a leader in esports, if you really want to change the game, as so many marketers and brand folks say about their programming, then then live by that, sleep by that, you know, breathe by that. You know, I think Eric Thomas has good quotes, but if you if a lot of the times if you wanted it as bad as you want to sleep or if as bad as you want to breathe, mm -hmm. then you'll be successful. But until then, you know, Beyonce doesn't sleep for three days at a time. Kanye right. doesn't sleep for three days at a time, maybe for different reasons. But either way, that that's what you guys are missing. The difference between you and excellence is what you're not putting in. Mm. Well said. How can people follow you in ways that you would like them to? <laughs> I'm actually verified on Twitter, and it was a practical joke. But I'm I'm uh, at Cam uh, Cameron Kelly 23 on most platforms. Um, you can you can find me on LinkedIn. Same thing. You can find me on on Twitter. Uh, I'm not on Instagram. I'm not exciting. That's why I don't take pictures. Um, you can find me everywhere else. And, and Maestro, you can find it, you know, at Maestro.io on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and wherever wherever else um, you might be looking. It's pretty much the same thing. So, yeah, that's that's where you'll find us. Love it. Well, mm -hmm. it's always a pleasure to sit down with you. Likewise. It's even greater to have the opportunity to have one of our many discussions be broadcast. A lot of people can learn beyond what I typically learn through our <laughs> conversations. So appreciate that. Thank you, Cam Kelly. Join me today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Of course, anytime. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.